Little did I know that just within an hour of this particular session, the uh, Knesset would have passed the first of four items in the judicial overhaul and that we would see the scale and intensity of protests that we are seeing now. So for all of you here, uh, we are witnessing a historic moment and also a moment to explore whether civic protest, civic action can and will succeed. Israel has a long history of protests that have been successful, some more than others. And we are really, really pleased to have the head of the politics and communication department at Hadassah Academic College in Jerusalem. And he's also one of the founders himself of a nonprofit advancing social entrepreneurship called the Mali Center for Enterprising Citizens. So we really have a specialist on protests. Uh, this is indeed a very important, uh, I agree, historic day uh, for Israel. It's sort of a climax of the past seven months that have been uh, quite a turmoil in, in Israel. So jumping right into this quite long and intensive period, uh, it's not uh, just one movement. Actually, there's a counter movement like in many other cases where there's mass movement, there is a counter movement, uh, and they reflect deep aspects in Israeli society currently. So to look at an historical perspective, we have had many and major protest events from the first decade of Israel's, after Israel's establishment with the Vadi Salib, it was more of a kind of one week protest, very intense, the Black Panthers in 71, following the Yom Kippur War, we had a massive movement that eventually brought down Prime Minister Golda Meir, who resigned due to these protests and pressures. Uh, we had the Peace Now movement that is credited in forcing Menachem Begin to step down as prime minister. We had the major uh, protest in the 90s in the context of corruption, the Four Mothers movement that is credited with the withdrawal of uh, the IDF from uh, southern Lebanon. We had a major protest event that uh, is somewhat uh, perhaps Similar, many people make the equivalence over the disengagement plan where Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip 2005-2006. Perhaps the most similar is the social justice protest movement in 2011, which is closest in the sense that it was also a massive movement involving tens of thousands of citizens protesting each week and across Israel with 10 towns. We also had a more recent one, the protest against Netanyahu in 2020, 2001, which is credited in leading the collapse of Netanyahu's government then. So these movements, at least this movement and the disengagement plan and the social justice protest movement are more similar. As I mentioned, the social justice protest movement 2011 is closest to this. In fact, the spokesperson of the 2011 movement is now also at, at the headquarters of the current movement against the government. This uh, specific movement started after Yariv Levin, Minister of Justice, January 4th, less than a week after this current government was sworn in at late December. He already came out to the media without prior discussion, by the way, with the Likud or with the, almost anyone else. I think he even, even discussed it with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He went to the press and he explained all the phases of what came to be known as the judicial overall, how he's going to uh, reform the judicial system in Israel, not just the courts, but also the attorney general and the prosecution uh, and many other aspects. And that has led immediately uh, to already, see January 7th, uh, there was already a big protest in Habima Square in Tel Aviv. It was raining back then, it was uh, winter. And then gradually, but quite fast, the protests grew in numbers. The Habima Square was too small to contain all the protests. So by February, uh, we are already seeing protests both in the Kaplan begging intersection in Tel Aviv and some big protests in Jerusalem, one of the biggest protests in Jerusalem, reaching hundreds of thousands of Israelis with really an uncomparable protest in terms of size and length. There are some comparisons to previous protests, but in terms of the length of these protests and their size, 
It is uncomparable to anything that I know from Israel history. It is, in fact, uncomparable, as far as I know, to most protests around the world. Of course, there were major protests, for example, in the United States, the civil rights movement, of course, but in terms of the sheer size, compared to the size of the population, this is quite amazing. In fact, 20% of Israelis reported that they have participated in at least one protest activity. So Israel has a population of about 9 million. Many of them, of course, do not participate or cannot participate. They're very young in age and so on. So this is quite remarkable, internationally so and historically so. So aside from the big protest at the end of each week at the Shabbat evening, which showed the movement in terms of its strength in numbers, which was a major way that this movement exerted political pressure on the political system, they also enacted what came to be known as the disruption days. Days of Rage, Disruption Days, National Disruption Day, they came with different names. But the main innovation here was that there were many, many local initiatives all around Israel, and people wanted to do things during the week and not only during the Shabbat evenings. The resistance headquarters, which is a special organization which doesn't really have control over all these local organizations, but it managed to coordinate all these activities into a single day. One of the major aspects of this movement was that people blocked roads, block the airport, block the train stations, children uh, with their parents out of school, really massive disruptions, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes often, in fact, corresponding with what's happening on the political agenda of the Knesset. So that was quite innovative way of protest activity. There were also interesting elements here of the claiming and reclaiming of the Israeli uh, flag. <laughs> on both sides, by the way. So many people who protested against the government quite quickly and spontaneously embraced the flag, the national flag. Now, this may seem obvious, but it's not for many people, especially in previous years, the flag was not seen as a, as a sign of protest against Netanyahu in 2020, they adopted the black flag, then the pink front and other colors as a sign and as a color that symbolizes the protest. What has happened in this protest over the past seven months is quite interesting in the sense that people reclaimed the flag as a sign of protest. So it became quite ironic that people walking with flags are seen as protests and people from the right wing seeing a person with the flag are, are re rebuking him or her. You can see here also this shirt, it symbolizes or it celebrates Israel's 75th uh, anniversary in the, from independence. But what is also happening here is that it is framed uh, in Hebrew with Lamed Chaf Lech, go. And the message is directed to Netanyahu, go away. You see here protesters from the right also embracing the national flag. So often in protests, you would not be able to separate or identify who's protesting for and against, especially if they're kind of mixed, because they're all waving the same flag. So you have to come up close and read that we support the judicial reform, which leads me to another element, and that is a lot of creative messages by the best minds of Israel's commercial and media professionals who went into the protest. And on these two sites, I recommend this group, uh, which is kind of a creative front, and also Dunevich, who is a one-person show who is very, very influential in this protest with his creative messages. Another element is the role played by WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is very, very popular in Israel. Some countries do not use WhatsApp. In Israel, everyone has WhatsApp. What you see here are different protest groups, by the way, for those who support what they consider as a reform. And this is a major tool of protest in Israel, organizing through WhatsApp, passing on information to participants, calling for help in organizing food, in volunteers, where to show up. Everything you can think of is organized through WhatsApp and there is tons and tons of motivations to volunteer. Very quickly to some of the key factors of the movement against the judicial overall. As I mentioned, there was a resistance headquarters that involved some of the kind of brightest and most experienced minds in Israel. They managed to collect donations from over 40,000 donor protests. 
totaling over 20 million Israeli shekels aside from private donations uh, that has helped to fund the huge expenses in organizing uh, the protest each uh, Shabbat in Tel Aviv with pickers and videos and whatnot. This headquarters did not have control and does not have control over all these local groups, but it did manage to coordinate strategically and tactically with all these groups. There were important political pressures here on specific members of parliament and government with groups that target, uh, for example, Gallant, the Minister of Defense, also interfering in public events, became very big and very successful in reaching public media and gaining public approval. The pressure by army veterans and reserve service soldiers has been and still is a major factor impacting the government and the political pressures on it with these army veterans. The IDF is built on reserve duty and people go to the army after they finish their duty service at least once a year. So they said we're not going to continue volunteer to the IDF and that was a major factor pressuring Gallant. There was also the involvement of hundreds and hundreds of experts from economics, from legal scholars, political scientists. Over 20,000 experts have signed petitions and public statements against what the government was proposing to do. Media coverage was massive. It was also in-depth in terms of really examining and comparing Israel to the world. How are we similar? How are we different? What are the implications? Really interesting also in trying to measure how many people participate in the protest events for and against what the government was doing. The international players were prominent here, like Germany, France, of course, uh, United Kingdom, and of course, the United States, where Biden is still signaling to Netanyahu to stop. The outcomes are several. The first peak was uh, late March, at the end of these two days, where Netanyahu uh, essentially fired, dismissed Minister of Defense Gallant, who spoke against the judicial overall. That has led to massive protests and eventually Netanyahu caved and stopped the legislation. That was a major achievement that led people to understand the power of protest. That has signaled how effective protest can be. That has fueled future protests, both on those who are against it, but also for those who are in favor of the reform. The second outcome was a shift in public opinion. As you can see, that even right-wing voters, over a third, oppose the government. And that's a major issue, which is also reflected in prediction of uh, how the seats will be distributed if elections were held today. A fall for the Likud and a rise of the central parties. Leading up to today, another reaction was that the right-wing became uh, adamant in passing something. The right-wing members in parliament said, if we are not going to pass anything, this coalition would not stay in power. And so today they have passed a law that limits the reasonable legal doctrine. By the way, generally only for the government. So other regular employees of the state are still obliged to use the law reasonably, but not the elected politicians. Another outcome is an increasing political polarization, which we have seen in the past seven months. Uh, this is a major protest of right-wing supporters of the government yesterday in Tel Aviv. They went to the Begin Kaplan intersection to show their strength and supporting numbers. So you can see their demonstration here, several tens of thousands at least. And today in Israel, and still as we speak, Jerusalem is blocked. The major intersections and roads are blocked in Jerusalem. This has become a day of rage. Many people were there. I was there in the morning. But this has led to major polarization with a lot of, sorry to say, hatred between the camps, with the people here on the right-hand side saying, I'm a second-class citizen because you are preventing my elected members of parliament from passing what I want them to pass. And on the left-hand side saying, secular people are not slaves. 
So the, the self-conceptions of many Israelis has become more radicalized and I'm sorry to say more hateful towards the, the other. And that's a major, major concern for Israel and the politicians are quite aware of this. I'm going to give you a few details from a survey that I have conducted in the past week. I'm currently doing a research on the social psychology of this protest. I'm going to share with you just a few numbers. For example, you see, to what extent do you feel personally threatened by the moves of the government? The sense of threat that people sense. This is on a scale of one to seven of a group of more than 700 participants. The average is 6.3. So people really sense this legislation as a personal threat to their values, to their very being. Whether it's rational or not, it's obviously a different question, but that's how people sense it. They participate in the protest accordingly because they sense pride. It makes them feel more meaningful. It affects their self-esteem. Not participating is also affecting their self-esteem. So this leads people to participate. Obviously, mostly people who feel threatened, namely those who oppose the legislation, but also those who are in favor of this, who feel that there is a lot on the scales here. If you want to compare this to what's uh, happening in the United States, that has uh, several lines of resemblance, for example, in terms of political polarization between Democrats and Republicans. So how does this compare to what's happening in Israel? What lessons can be learned from what's happening in, in Israel to what's happening in the United States or vice versa. You can analyze public opinion polls about political polarization and discuss projects of how to decrease them because obviously no one wants political polarization. It's quite a consensus, but everyone thinks that they are not the one who are extreme and that should compromise, etc. If this passed an hour ago, does it mean, should we infer that the protest movement failed? I don't think so. I think the protest movement against, obviously, has succeeded in many ways. First of all, it succeeded in stopping several major legislation proposals that were already about to be voted into law. And they were off the table and they did, did not raise them again. Now, they actually brought something completely different, the reasonable legal doctrine. So... Back then, they were about to change the way judges are nominated in Israel and prevent the Supreme Court from overturning undemocratic legislation. So that has stopped. So secondly, in, in shifting public opinion, this is not something to take light upon, especially for politicians, because they constantly look at what people think. And they look at the polls and they see they lose support and they see the public doesn't want this. And that's a major leverage. It's a different question. Why do they see it and still continue despite public reaction? And the answer to that is in the realm of politics, where Netanyahu wants to keep his government. He's afraid that he's going to lose his coalition if he's not going to give something to the more extremist side of his coalition. Also his self-interest in terms of his legal proceedings, but also I think that the reaction, the strong reaction that is happening right now in the streets of Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv and in elsewhere, where people are still rushing in, in buses, public transportation, public uh, private ones to Jerusalem after the fact, it sends a strong message to the government. The minorities, and in particular Israel's Arab society, have really benefited from the Supreme Court and its rulings and being able to have their rights ensured through that. Do we see them in these protests? Not enough, unfortunately. There, there, there have been many articles about this. The Arab population considers this as a, an internal Jewish thing. Many of them do not participate. There have been attempts to bring them in, to say, you're also going to be affected. In fact, the first to be affected by this judicial overall would be the minorities, the Arabs, LGBT community, the women, etc. And the Arabs do not see this as their struggle. They see the Supreme Court as a Zionist institution that has taken negative decisions towards Palestinians in the West Bank, and they're not participating. And also, if you look visually on the protest, you see a sea of Israeli flags, national flag. So for some of them, it's difficult to participate in a protest that is so national. There is within this movement a very strong anti-occupation movement that tries to push messages against Israel's annexation or occupation of the West Bank 
and to say there is no democracy with occupation. So they're kind of trying to work within this movement to say these two things are related. What's so terrible about having checks and balances on the legislative power on the Supreme Court? Shouldn't it be a norm? Should the Supreme Court be completely independent? Checks and balances are an imperative part of democracy as much as part of the rule of law. And obviously, the decision by the majority, which is also an important feature of democracy, obviously. The, the problem is that Israel doesn't have many checks and balances. In fact, the, the only institutional power that exerts checks and balances in Israel is the Supreme Court. And even that was a slow protest of building up legal doctrines from uh, Israel's first days over the, the past 75 years of its existence. The Knesset doesn't really function as a check and balance on the government because it's a coalition government. And as long as the government has a majority by virtue of being in power, the Knesset would not check the government. So the only institutional body really to, to do so is the Supreme Court. A little bit also the Attorney General is a role that has garnered more power over the past 20, 30 years. But if you take the power of the Supreme Court, for example, over government decisions, there is no real checks and balances on the government. It can do virtually anything it wants. Obviously, there are checks and balances over the Supreme Court as well. For example, the nomination of judges in Israel. If the politicians do not want a certain judge, he or she would not be nominated. They have a veto power. Now that this law, this particular proposal has passed, does that put us on the spectrum of democracies closer to Poland, closer to the United States? How do we fall now as Israel is transforming? Democracy doesn't fall in a single legislation. No single legislation is the end of democracy, but the culmination of many acts will eventually prevent free and fair elections. And that's what it's leading up to. This could be a major setback in the sense that the, now the government could potentially uh, fire the attorney general. And she is standing in their way to do whatever they want. And for example, they can replace her and bring in a different attorney general that can stop Netanyahu's trial. I think this would be the most likely abuse of power, because from my perspective, everything we've seen in Israel in the past uh, several years is about Netanyahu's trial. So it's very possible that this will happen, and that will lead to the collapse of the rule of law. If the rule of law is now subordinated to one person's wishes, especially if he's the prime minister, this is a major setback to the rule of law, which is a central pillar of democracy. What are the chances that the Likud parliament members will turn sides and this government fails? Is there somebody who's going to vote E.A. Moon, no confidence in this government? And can this be undone by the next government that comes in? So it could be undone by the next government, and that's what the opposition members are saying, that they're just going to overturn everything in the next government. That is, if we have free and fair elections, and if the government doesn't, for example, take over the Central Election Commission and starts vetoing the participation of Arab parties, some members of the coalitions are saying that. But the key political players are indeed within the Likud. They're not in the ultra-religious parties. They're not in the ultra-nationalist parties. The key for change here is within the Likud. There are not many moderate members there, but there are some. For example, the Minister of Defense managed to stop the legislation in March, and he tried to do so today, but he didn't eventually vote against it. But there are some members more likely to say no more. We're not going to pass additional legislation without broad consensus. We're not going to tear these people apart. We're not going to jeopardize the security and the economics of Israel. Behind the scenes, they're saying that they're against it. And they're trying to prevent it. But eventually, there is coalition discipline that they have to abide by. And they vote with the coalition because they don't want to be sanctioned. It's a miserable situation, but I'm hopeful because if you pressure them and pressure them, eventually they will say no more. I'm not just a finger for increasing polarization. I understand that the coalition needs this to survive. But that's the last time I'm doing this, and I'm hopeful that they will not continue to do so for the next acts that are forthcoming. What is the worst possible scenario that could unfold 
in the next three, six, nine months, two years. One is that Netanyahu will manage to use his power to stop uh, his trial or to uh, achieve uh, some kind of easy plea bargain that he has tried to sign in the past. The second problem would be the abuse of power by the coalition to prevent free and fair elections. They've already raised some proposals to that end, like the disqualification of certain Arab parties and Arab members with all sorts of tricks and taking over the Central Election Commission and replacing the Supreme Court, who is the head of that commission, with a politician <laughs> that represents the coalition views. And here we are in a completely different ball game where the rules are not fair. Is anybody talking right now about having a constitution and writing one and passing that? I think we're a very long way from a constitution. In fact, members on the right see a constitution as something negative. Uh, members that are against the reform are shouting, we want a constitution now. So like everything else, it becomes polarized. And also you want a constitution. We are against the constitution. And we are also against the basic law on human dignity and liberty. So everything becomes very politicized and very polarized. And it's very difficult to hold a serious discussion. Certainly Israel needs a constitution, but I would go with something much more lean, much more simple in enacting a basic law that there is agreement on called basic law, the legislation that defines what is a basic law rather than a regular law, what's its standing, how do you pass it, what majority do you need to pass it, to amend it, basic things that all liberal democracies have, and we should definitely fix that. This would lay down the rules of the game, not the content, but the how you do it. And that would prevent many of the problems that we see uh, right now.